questions, intimidation, whatever. And when we were at the police station, the, the, we're, we're trying to negotiate to get the people released. There was women there that were held over the weekend. Um, they didn't release them, actually. But the, the policeman actually called Sharif Pandor and actually had him on speakerphone to say, what should we do about this situation, about these arrested people? There's people here demanding, saying they're going to contact the media, demanding to release these people. But I mean, that can give you a really good idea of some of us who've been working with communities for a long time, affected by platinum and other, other um, mineral resources, that it's, it's extremely challenging with these conflicts of interest as well. And I think if you look next door in Mondas Hook, you've got Patrice Monzepi, who's the partner with um, Anglo Platinum, with A African Rainbow Minerals, and then Bridget Khadebe, <laughs> who is also the partner in, in Macau Mining with Impala. So I just wanted to share that story um, as sort of an experience also of that problem of conflict of interest. Thank you. Okay, I'll make an exception. Please give to the uh, gentleman from the Bahata Tribal Authority. He might shed some light on some of these issues. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me share some light, as you have already mentioned. My name is Fabio Maraka from Bakata Wata Fena. Uh, I want to make mention that the presentation is just a synopsis of the actual, not of the actual situation that is happening amongst Bakata Wata Fena. Uh, when you talk of Kosi Nyalaba Malife John Pilar, you talk of the, the monarch in Northwest. It's not a small boy. You must understand that. He's in control of Mohase Police Station. He's in control of all the magistrates and the lawyers around Mohase. He's in control of the media. He is in control of high courts in Northwest. He is in control of the investors. His motivation is from the investors because of the uh, platinum mines there. He's in control of land affairs. He's in control to all politi most of the politicians in South Africa. There's nothing that you can do to him. As far as our experience is concerned, we have tried him uh, by approaching all officials, all institutions in Northwest, including President Becky's office. I was there. I was there at the Scorpion by day. Nobody in South Africa can do him nothing. He's that kind of a man. Uh, based on that, we have formulated, so now we have talked about Kowako. Kowako has been formulated, organized by the Pilani families who were dissatisfied about the action of the chief from 1999 to date 2013. Already, by old age, sicknesses, more than, more than eight members of Kowako died based on that. Some of them uh, with heart attacks. He's not a small boy. Uh, based on that, realizing that we are the power of the powerless as Kobako and as community, uh, we embarked in CPA, Communal Property Association, official. All the processes have been undertaken at Bakata Baka the chief himself, Nyala, the monarch, opposed everything. We had to go for elections for the third time without money, without any sponsor, without anything. Up to the, today, we won the case in court on the 14th of June so that a uh, land affairs must give us certificate for CPA. Even up to date, the certificate is not yet issued. So I make an appeal that we need 150% legal assistance in South Africa and abroad, if possible. Because people
people cannot uh, be denied to enjoy their rights, the rights of ownership of the land, the rights of minerals, and all the rights by one person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, over. Thank you. Thank you. Over to the panel now. Um, I'll just give you this mic. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Asanda, for that question. What is legitimate and illegitimate castle? I would say ask the courts in South Africa. You know, what has happened, for instance, in the case of Bakhat, which I was referring to, from time to time, they seem to have uh, taken that custom is a rigid inherited set of rules that, that, that continues, you know, from generation to how things have always been done. That is why they have always consulted the paramount chief to declare what custom is. And whatever version of custom the paramount chief says, then that becomes custom. With regards to land and women, yeah, it does seem that custom is becoming very flexible, to, uh, particularly in the new political dispensation. I mean, I think there's quite a lot of influence in that, and I mean, of realizing constitutional rights of women, because now that is starting to change. You will see, for instance, but what is strange is that women tend to be given, I mean, from two, I noticed this in two villages, women tend to be given land a little bit outside the village where, you know, most of, of the single women will be allocated plots, you know, so, so that, that is one of what I can really highlight, I mean, about the question of legitimate and illegitimate custom, because the constitution recognizes the institutional tribal, I mean, of traditional authority in line with custom, and it doesn't define what is legitimate custom. So, legitimate custom then becomes what the courts decides to be legitimate custom, and depending on, on who is in favor of the courts at the time. That is why you find that in most villages, people think that uh, because the chief has money, he has power to influence the court, and the court will decide on his version. I can just highlight one example. There were a group of, I mean, of concerned uh, people who regard themselves as, as a royal family in, in Pilamins, like in the Bakatla area. But, but that, that, that was during the time when Nyalala had good relations with the, with the paramount chief in Vedegomas in Botswana. And the paramount chief issued an affidavit, you know, saying that those people are not part of, of the royal family. And Nyalala was, I mean, then the powers of Nyalala were entrenched. But later on, when the relationship between Nyalala and the paramount chief turned sour, then another version of customer law was written that recognizing all the families of the people who, whom the paramount chief said they were not part of, of the royal family, recognizing them as a royal family. So it's quite, it's, it will be interesting because the case was largely decided on those grounds that those people cannot raise anything against the chief because they cannot even, they cannot appoint and, I mean, and remove the chief. They cannot decide on who, is, who should be the chief because remember, I mean, the framework recognizes that an institution called a royal family should decide on who the chief would be. So if, if the royal family, so then if the paramount chief decides who the royal family is, he can shift whoever is not aligned with him at whatever point in time. So this is really a mess. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll, I'll respond to Ray's question, which was direct to me, and Tara's question, which two questions, which were apparently to all of us. Ray, Ray, just on the question of uh, royalties to equities, um, well, obviously, to convert a royalty and equity, you have to be in receipt of royalty first. And only a certain number of tribal authorities were in receipt of royalty before the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act, and they were in receipt of it by virtue of having some degree of titular ownership within mineral rights, which was bound up with this particular property regime that I'm describing which is very, very specific or distinctive in, in, in this kind of form to particularly the Rustenburg area. So there are probably three, three very prominent tribal authorities, the Bukhapa Bakafela in, in relation to the Union Mine, the Buffkin in relation to Impala and part of Amplats, 
and the Bapa Bamakali in relation to Lonmin. So those are the ones who are most affected by that measure. There may be others, but those, those are the most prominent cases. However, there are other routes in, in, into equity stakes in mining companies. Another one was for those which had some degree of control over mineral resources, was to get into a joint venture with a mining company where they would say, we will allow you to access this resource and you will give us a, a stake. So it's basically, um, it's basically a sort of swap, so joint ventures came out of that. But then after the NPRDA came in effect, no mineral rights ended up in, 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 the hands of the, in the hands of the state. Then the main avenue then becomes section 104 of the NPRDA, which was Tracy was talking about, where a so-called community which can demonstrate that it has, as Tracy was saying, um, ownership in the land in question, or is about to get ownership in the land in question, and the technical capacity to exploit it can then also qualify for a preferential, a preferential prospecting right or mining right. What is the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is very well illustrated by the Bank of Nyama case, looking at it from a, sort of a more sort of political economy dimension, which is what it then means is competing mining companies, which are trying to get their hands on the same resource, will start sniffing around for the entity which can, which can present itself in legal terms and administrative terms as being the legitimate community which does have or will get the right in that land. And actually in the Benguet, and, and so you end up with a form of what I call tribal fronting. And in the Benguenyama case, in fact, what you end up with is not just standing behind the Rocco Pasha in their claim to S104 rights, um, Genora, and standing behind that now Chinese capital, but also, as Tracy mentioned, you have a whole set of mining interests also standing behind Benguenyama resources as well. So this, this is actually a fight between my rival mining companies to get their hands on this resource, which is being mediated through these struggles over land and, and authority, etc., etc., in all the complex ways that we've, that we've spoken about. Of course, there's more to it than that. But that is, that, that is a logical outcome, and this is what is going on on an increasing scale. In terms of Tara's questions, um, the intergenerational um, argument for royalty to equity, well, I suppose there are two levels at which we could look at this. Um, in fact, there are three. I mean, the, the, fir the first is just, just, as, just, as a fact of, uh, just as a fact of record. When the Minerals Development Bill first came on the, came on the agenda in December 2000, actually, it wasn't then the perspective for the Buffer King authority that it wanted to convert its royalty in, into an equity, but rather what it wanted to do was negotiate an exemption from the state whereby it could keep on receiving its royalty in exactly the way, the same way that it has without being subject to all these new forms of regulation. So that actually was its initial perspective. The Department of Minerals and Energy made it very clear that this was going to be non-negotiable, and so it started looking around for other solutions. The other solution was to convert it into equity in, into a stake in the company. And I think the key distinction we need to look, be looking at there is a distinction between the private and the public. Because essentially what it was faced with was, was the danger of having its private royalty stream brought into the public domain for this new apparatus of the developmental royalty. And it found a way to get around that by becoming a shareholder like any other shareholder, which would not then be subject to those forms of public regulation. So that's part of the story. The second is that with, with the intergenerational notion, well, the problem with that is wh whether it's a royalty or whether it's an equity stake, it is still dependent on a resource which is dwindling. And one can still presumably um, invest the royalties from the, the revenues from a royalty or the revenues that you're getting through share dividends in something else which will allow you to diversify. So I can't quite see what the difference is there. But then the third thing, and I think the really key thing, is the question of well, who actually gets this revenue? This is the, this is the big issue. And, and um, the, original, the original design, as I said, of, of, of the minerals policy was that actually all revenues which were, go, which were coming from mining in this way would go upwards to government and then would come downwards again. So they would then be subject, they would be fully brought back into the public domain and they would be fully subject to private, sorry, to, to public, regulation. Now this is not to make an argument that the post apartheid state is perfect, of course it is not perfect, but at least you have recourse in law to a whole number of administrative and other 
apparatus if there is abuse of funds within the state, which you do not have if you're dealing with a private shareholder. It brings it out of that public domain. And that then probably connects them with, with, the, with the other question that you're asking about which level at which we look at this, whether it's history or whether it's process or whether it's service delivery. Well, on all of those levels, these things are highly contested within the Buffer King area. People from there can tell us about that a lot better, and people who have done other research independently can tell us about that. But the one thing I would say is that really this is missing the point. The point is this. There are 17 to 21 million black South Africans living, living within the former homeland areas. And they are living under a different political regime from those that live within, are living within the former white South Africa. They are living under forms of authority which are not elected, which are not accountable, which have evaded various forms of accountability and, and regulation. And this is leading to massive abuses of power of the type that we've just had described in the Bukhadra area. So by accident of birth, where you end up, it tells you what form of state you're actually going to be confronting. And this is the real tension in the new South Africa. Should there, should there be democracy, um, should there be formal liberal democracy in its entirety if, if you happen to be living in former white South Africa and then if you're in former rural South Africa? Or should there actually be a genuinely unified dispensation where everybody had, confronts the same form of the state, no matter how imperfect it is, at least they do so as citizens and not as subjects? Okay, I'm sure that you pressed for time, so I won't be long. Um, just to say, the lady from Ayanra, yes, that was also the experience of the Bingham Yama when Janora was first granted the rights, and they had a similar experience of prospecting taking place you know, right next to their homes and, and problems with the police and so on. I think I'm just going to answer the... mainly focus on the question about the free, prior and informed consent, and thank you for raising it. So. That makes me think of, of Cesar's presentation around ethnicity you don't gov. And, and if pick is a technique of governance, it's a way of governing indigenous people um, so that you, you defer their substantive claims indefinitely. That's how I see it. I don't believe it's the model, the APRDA has that model. We, we don't require consent to prospect on land. All that is required is consultation. There has been a lot of um, and happiness around consultation and, and the recognition of the dysfunctionalities of consultation, and mainly raised by NGOs, not by communities um, under tribal authority. But I, I stand corrected because there is a now a new um, community association called MEJCOM, Mining and Environmental Justice Community Alliance, that is certainly taking up these issues of consultation. But I don't think it's I don't think that's the technique of governance that the MPRDA uses. Rather, they govern communities at the tail end of broad-based economic, black economic empowerment. That's, that's the technique of governance. <coughs> then the question around, you know, can you have like something overarching that helps you, helps you, that helps you deal with the, these conflicts in between different pieces of legislation? My point is that you can't. You know, it's, it's inherent that if you have more, more and more legal texts, you're just going to have more and more um, uh, conflicts and amnesias and gaps. So the, the question is, how do you internalize these things? Who's the custodian of the transformative vision? And it's not something that you're going to get from external, you know, it's, it's something that has to be taken up. Um, so yeah, that's my, my view on it. And then the final question around the tribal authority, all I would say on that is that I will go back to what Peter Schoen said about transformative constitutionalism, that it's a process whereby the old and the new are continuously redefined and neither is left untouched. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask uh, for your indulgence because I thought we'd have another round, but I've ran completely out of time. Um, and, you know, at least Gavin, some of his comments sounded like concluding remarks, so <laughs> thank you for giving me two. Um, so, uh, all I can do now is uh, thank everyone. I'll make one or two uh, comments myself. Uh, I think you remember that poster of Lenin sweeping the money bags and the capitalists off the face of the earth. And part of those were kings and queens and princes. So that's, that was our vision, you know, during the struggle against apartheid that 
would get rid of the Bankistan leaders, the chiefs, Mahosi. How wrong we were. So this is a real, a real challenge. Maybe it exposes, you know, the urban bias in our thinking, in our struggle at the time. Maybe we had our own version of Rostow's modernization theory. <laughs> Maybe it could have been more appropriate to think of uh, an even and combined development, because these things don't seem to go away. So uh, with those words, um, I'd like to thank the panel and thank all of you for being patient and disciplined until this time. So let's give them a round of applause and for ourselves. And I believe that, uh, thank you, I believe that now we're ready for Rihat Desai's uh, new movie on Marikana. Can I just uh, tell, most of you will be, okay, Eddie, I'll point you out. Most of you will be here tomorrow, but some of us will be in Pretoria marching to union, union buildings, demanding that the state should pay the legal fees of the victims of the massacre. Uh, but since uh, Ed is my senior, what do you want to say, Ed? I need some help. I lost a bunch of keys. Has anyone seen, them? Has anyone seen a bunch of keys that uh, Professor Webster has lost? Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh,